What's up, everybody? We just wrapped one up with Mr. Ryan Muckenheim here. Not about a cartridge this time. Instead, we actually talked about why it is that we hunt and kind of got into a bunch of other human A little kind. deep. It really got a little bit deep, I would say. It's a, a few bit, rabbit trails. Some rabbit trails, all good things. A little bit different than what we've normally done, so we're curious to hear your guys' feedback on this particular one. Also curious to hear why it is that you hunt and what you think about some of the topics we bring up here with the very deep and well-spoken and well-thought yes. Mr. Ryan. Spoiler alert, I used the word intimate twice in less than five seconds. Sorry. And then a few other times, actually. Really? At one point, you even just said it. Just, I think you just, it just came out. Just right? Yeah. Intimate. Um, somebody can maybe keep a ticker on that for us. But otherwise, enjoy watching this one. Thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, we'll, well, I guess we'll catch you next time because you're about to catch this one. All right, enjoy. What's up, everybody? You have Jimmy here on the mic, Mark next to me, and Mr. Ryan Muckenhern across the table. Now, today, we aren't going to be discussing cartridges with Ryan. We're going to give his uh, beautiful mind a rest on that. And we're going to discuss the topic of sort of why it is that we hunt. Now, we felt, I guess, when we were discussing the idea of bringing this topic up, we thought, you know, well, to some that may seem a bit like a snooze fest. It's sort of like, well, that's a very personal thing for, you know, why I hunt, why Mark hunts, why Ryan hunts. But sometimes just listening to, you know, maybe other people's stories as to why the, what their emotional connection is. Ryan, you were saying why it even causes you to just get out of bed in the morning. Uh, you know, for those who are listening out there, maybe who you like hunting, you, you used to do it, maybe you've fallen out of it a little bit. Uh, perhaps some inspiration. Also, I guess just to kind of get to know maybe a little bit of the people who you've listened to on the radio. Um, curious to get your thoughts on this one, though, as we, as we dive into it. But, uh, yeah, that I... Did I intro that? I think you nailed it, Jim. I think you nailed it. I mean, we've got a small, intimate group here. I think this is a, you know, it's a personal, intimate topic. When you keep saying intimate, I get a little uncomfortable. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I could. I I'm kind of, I'm, I'm going to scooch away I'm from you. I'm feeling that myself, actually. So, Different Ryan. word choice. Ri that's all right. Ryan, explain what you were talking about earlier here, about why it is that you hunt. Because I think when you got into it, it wasn't just sort of like, I hunt because I like it, it's fun. It was just, it was like, it's I, more than that. Yeah, I reflect on it quite a bit because I, I think of I think of myself in modern times and, and what modern man needs to survive. And nothing about hunting big game, small game, or waterfowl from, from a, a first world nation, um, a middle class person is, is, is fiscally responsible or required. There's no reason to do it. But on the same breath, it is, it is the all-consuming thing in my life. It's the only thing I think about, and it's really the only thing I put um, all my efforts into. I have a, a prehistoric compulsion, uh, like in my DNA, that, that makes me do this. Um, and it's, re it's really interesting, because I can go to the grocery store and I can buy food. It's, to quote Mark, prepackaged and ready for consumption. Uh, of course, he wasn't talking about meat. He was talking about ammo. And I can do it <laughs> and, and save money in the long run. I think about the, the amount of money that I spend on tags and equipment and um, time and wear and tear on my vehicle. And, and it's just, it's silly if you look at it from, from a numbers approach. You're, you're not going to, you can't really attack it from like, oh, this is the practical thing to do any anymore, no, right? No. No, yeah. But, you know, I was Don't sitting, tell my wife I said that, by the way. No, I honey use is the still opposite of this argument free. quite a Here's bit. Here's the thing. I think if we really get into this, if you're listening to this as, you know, and your significant other is next to you and they, they're not a huge fan of the fact that you love hunting, we, you may want to just turn this one off. I, I mean, they're going to hear... They're going to hear probably a little bit of how expensive it is and just how much of an investment it is. Right. <laughs> not even not even focusing on the money. No, even, yeah. But just just how man's modern form is out of place in the field um, in today's society of tarmac and skyscrapers and things. Uh, and and I re it really kind of caught caught me off guard a couple of weeks ago. I was in uh, northwestern South Dakota mule deer hunting, and. Um, my hunting partner's getting up in age and, and 
you know, he's not as fast as he used to be. Uh, and it was, it was hell for him to get out to the spot where we were hunting. Like if it was physically difficult for him to do this. Um, and it was, as I sat there and I, I, I'm glassing over these big rocks and vistas and valleys and pine stands. I'm like, why do we do this? Why do we put ourselves through this? Why do we put heavy packs on our backs and, uh, run the threshold of, uh, like, cardiovascular failure to to get out in here and then we both walked away from that hunt empty empty handed it took us seven years to dry those tags and neither of us took an animal and, and like am i remorseful about that no i am not uh because in reflection <clears throat> i realized that if i didn't hunt and, and i'm just going to pick on mule deer because I, I really enjoy mule deer um if i didn't do that i wouldn't be in shape i think i would I wouldn't work as hard as I would at my job and I wouldn't work as hard as I would on the range or on the reloading bench or, or being like very conscientious about the gear that I purchase or even the, even the time I take for vacation, like during the year, I'd probably be a little more willy nilly with it all, but I need mule deer to stay in shape and I need mule deer to make, proper gear choices and intelligent gear selection. And I need mule deer to help me figure out when it is that I take time off and where I go. To be Um, excited about tomorrow. Yeah, correct. I do. I, it, it gives me something like even now my season is over. Um, I'm looking forward to the next tag. I'm going to hold in my hand. And, And it was interesting for me to walk away from that with as much work as we did put in with nothing in the bag. And, to, to have not felt defeated in the least, but rather like motivated to do more, to mm-hmm. go harder, to go deeper, to go farther. Do you think the fact, this is kind of a little bit off topic, do you think the fact that hunting season, the bulk of it, I should say, and I don't want to act like you can't hunt any other time of the year because we all know that's not true, but the bulk of it comes in such a short window. It's here, and just like that, it's gone, it seems, usually. Do you think that has something to do with a little bit of the fact why we feel the way we feel around it? Because it's 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 like that distance makes the heart grow fonder kind of thing where you go such a long period of the time of the year where you can't hunt deer. You can't necessarily do some of these things um, or not as easily or as accessibly or... I mean, do you think that has something to do with it? I do. I think it does. But speaking to the prehistoric man, um, I, I go somewhat manic in the months of... January, February, and March, because I, I don't, I'm not really an ice fisherman and a lot of the small game seasons have closed and there's not a lot to do, um, but sit and like, think about what I could have done differently. And, and I get, I get to this, this point of mania in those three month, that three month window where it's like, what am I going to do with myself? And then spring turkey comes and I'm satiated for a little bit. And then foraging season comes and I'm satiated for a little bit. But by that time, then again, I am thinking of of getting back out west. And so I'm pack training and I'm looking at different boots and I'm, I'm auditing my gear roster and all that. And, and I, I think like that has to come from something in my mitochondrial DNA that is more than just the time in between seasons. I think. Yeah. If that answers. It's kind of, well, I just think it's kind of interesting how the fact that seasons, which humans have put, on ourselves now modern day humans have yeah. put on game and for good reason this isn't this isn't like to say i hate see hunting season or anything like at all but it is kind of peculiar how if you look at like an ancient you're you're referring to this as almost like a caveman you know uh instinct back then they didn't have hunting seasons. right so i wonder if they had that that feeling that predator uh instinct that sort of like wild hair if you will all the time or if, you know, there had to have been, I would imagine, probably, who knows what. I'm, I'm going to talk about deer. I'm assuming cavemen had deer. I'm sure some paleontologists will go back and tell me that they're way different than they are today. But, you know, maybe they had their rutting season around fall as well. And maybe the fact that it's going to get colder in winter means that people start thinking about food, mm-hmm. almost like squirreling things away. So maybe there is something about fall that just naturally, even though our season comes in the fall still if that wasn't a thing we would still have this this feeling in ourselves about like fall is coming i must having to get having to prepare get ready yeah yeah stockpile yeah that's that's an interesting way to think about it you know i think i can only assume but 
you know, their their uh, level of urgency and also the level of consequence if they didn't hunt, if they weren't successful. It's it's life or death. Yes. Yeah. And and I think that for really anybody I know that's a hunter, they they share some degree of that sentiment. I think that you know some of the guys I know that are pretty much year rounders. They're they're traveling the world and doing it. It it's obviously elevated, but. But, you know, it's like late August comes, that light starts to change a little bit. There's that little smell in the air. Mm. And there is. There's a prehistoric drum that is struck. And, like... There is a, there is a smell. I can't put my finger. Cold smells like something. Yeah. Cold and, has a smell, the temperature. And when that happens, <laughs> man, I, I think my, my pupils dilate and my ears open up and, and, like, the hair on the back of my neck stands up and, like, I start, like, looking to the west. Yeah, like, I need, I need to go over there. funny that you say that because there is just, like, an electricity to it and to your point smelling it when that when it starts to make that switch and and people say it every year fall is in the air like I, the fall you know and that is a real thing it uh, is in the Jim, air Jim I'm wearing a long oh, sleeve but I got them yeah, yeah yeah but uh I take it in I literally try to like bring it as deep into my chest as I can like on that on those first and really all the, I guess you know even throughout as the season progresses but like those first days when it really just strikes you yeah, yeah. you're just like Yes, it's about time. Now, yep. in our classic podcast before the podcast, we discussed, Mark, you got into hunting via your dad mm-hmm. going yep. out. You just felt this need. We'll get in, into that maybe. Felt this need to go out with him. Uh, Ryan, I'd be curious because you're, you're describing it almost as something that's uncontrollable. It's just part of you that makes you go out. So I'm, is that what made you start hunting? Like where did all of a sudden... Because sometimes even in the past on some of the podcasts, you've explained how your way of hunting used to be kind of like, oh, well, you know. Uh, November 4th. Yeah. November 4th, yeah, okay, I guess I'll get up, throw myself in a tree and see if I see anything, and then, okay, that's done, now I'm over. You know, it, where did the switch flip? To, so, I, I've been fascinated with the out, outdoors for, from a very young age. And I think everybody's got a facilitator, right? Like, we speak English because that's what we were taught. We eat with forks because... That's what we were taught. Yeah. Um, but but some of this is innate to Absolutely. Person, right? So, you know, guys and gals out there that are hunters, like, I think everybody has the subset of skills, and perhaps they're just dormant. And then all of a sudden that egg is cracked, and, and then we're out. And so, I mean, I, I can recall from being a very, very, very young lad, like as far back as I can remember – like pre-kindergarten, I, and I can get back into the Little Lambs preschool days, I can remember just being fascinated with the prospects of wild things for no other reason other than it was just like part of me. And then I suppose when I was about four or five, my grandfather really, really poured gasoline on it, and then I was going a field um, with him in the fall hunting ducks and hunting rabbits. He was not a big game hunter, um, at that point in time. <clears throat> and then, you know, during the spring and summer, it was fishing. Um, but there would, I would say that, like, he was my catalyst. He was the one who, who really pushed me into it. And it wasn't necessarily just hunting or fishing. It was just outdoorsmanship and everything outdoors in general, um, yeah. whether it was hiking or whether it was looking at trees and why trees are the way they are and things like that. Um, yeah, so I, I think that that's where it came from. And then it, it, it kind of went dormant again a little bit when I got into grade school because you're fascinated by all these other things and people and sports and hobbies and, and schoolwork. And, and then when I, when I got my driver's license again, and then it really kind of went feral. And then, then it was like I had to just be out all the time doing something somewhere. And that's when I started hunting abroad, or at least outside of the state of Minnesota anyways, where I'm from. And, and it never slowed down. That That's... That's where it came from. Sea cars are important. They are. Mark. They get you where you need to go. 1992 yeah. Oldsmobile Cutlass. My buddy Travis and I went to a coyote calling contest in uh, North Dakota. No business driving down the roads. <laughs> we drove down <laughs> in that Cutlass. Uh, got very stuck. Uh, I don't think we would have made it. <laughs> I, I, Jim, I, I cannot tell you guys the amount of hunting and fishing my brother and I did uh, out of his 85 Toyota Supra, which was, Jim, you'll Gosh, appreciate this. Car. Oh, it was The great. old boxy variants of the Supra. 
That was it, did it was it still called a Celica Supra at that point or was it just the Supra? Oh, did it have it the flip headlights? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, a little pop up. Shout out to Donut Media, James Pumphreys. Pop up up and down. <laughs> it was a manual too, Jim. Oh, it's a good. You'd have loved it. It's a good vehicle. It was actually, you know, you talk about uh, out of necessity. Now, Jim, you know, I really can't drive a manual, but I have a couple times in my past. My brother was always trying to. You got to learn how to drive my car. I didn't care. Like I didn't. I didn't want to. Right. Yeah. And I think I was uh, maybe I was hell, eighteen or something like that. And for whatever reason, like, no, maybe I was sixteen. I think I was. I was sixteen, and I didn't have a car. And my brother had his Supra. My dad couldn't go deer hunting that weekend. My brother couldn't go to deer hunting that weekend. But by God, I was going to go deer hunting that weekend. <laughs> and so uh, I learned how to drive my brother's uh, uh, manual Supra well enough that I got the two and a half hours to where we'd hunt blacktails, Gosh, parked at the impressive. gate, hunted by myself all day. How was his clutch afterwards? Uh, he needed a new one. <laughs> he needed a new one. And, uh, I did, I saw a handful of, God, I remember it was just the, the windiest, nastiest, stormiest day. And, uh, I did, I did see one little spike, uh, that I gave, uh, I gave, uh, gave a pass to that day. But, uh, yeah, like, so that's, that's, that may be actually the last time I drove, uh, a manual transmission, Jim. I picture some collector nowadays because that was a Washington vehicle. So Washington vehicles are notorious for remaining rust free. I picture some collector finding this 1985 Toyota Celica Supra, and they think to themselves, "Oh my gosh, I found it! It's in Washington. It's going to be rust free. I'll be able to restore this to its former glory." They open up the trunk, and there inside is like. Loose shells from a shotgun, some blood stains, <laughs> some hair patches, and stuff like that from deer. And they think, that, what happened in this vehicle? I learned. I learned how to drive. Uh, well, kind of drive to steer vehicle from the right seat because. But this is everybody out there. This is back in the days of paper maps, and uh, so my brother and I would be like trying to find places to hunt fish or getting lost and trying to figure out where we were. And so uh, he was better at reading a map and also could drive a car so he would read the map and operate the pedals and then i would just steer and tell him (laughs) when to speed up and slow down and the question is why why do you do it well when you asked me that before we started here too uh, you're like mark why 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 did you go you know go hunting start hunting and i my answer was i didn't have a better answer because i had to yeah like and not because somebody made me had to because i I had to, you know, I, my, I knew my dad hunted. I've got a picture of myself and I probably got my, I guess my introduction to the outdoors fishing, but there's, there's a picture of me. I'm sitting on a dock. I think I'm like three years old. I got one of those old school orange life preservers on. And I can remember, you know, you think about very few memories from that early on in life. Mm-hmm. I remember that day. I remember not catching anything, being super frustrated. <laughs> some other kids were catching some things and that frustrated me more. Bastard. And, but also loving it at the same time, absolutely loving it, you know, and, and, my, and my dad hunted and I think you maybe you naturally just kind of want to do what dad does or a lot of folks. Right. But, um, you know, at the age of seven, you know, he's finally like, okay, you can, you can go hunting. So I went deer hunting with my dad and just absolutely loved it. Fascinated by it. Couldn't wait to go again. Begged to go all the time, you know, didn't go enough. You know, we'd, we didn't shoot a deer for several years. I don't think we, ki- we didn't kill a deer. I think I started hunting with my dad when I was seven. The first year we actually got a buck, I was 12. But I still yeah. loved going. And did when, the, did the, we had zero success. We'd occasionally energy, get a grouse. Did the energy change when you weren't successful? Or was it like you still had to get up and do this? No, I had to. In fact, honestly, like when we finally got one, it was kind of like um, shocking. Like it was almost like, uh, I mean, it added obviously like an extra giant layer of awesomeness you, to you, the day that you I caught had a never Sasquatch. Ex- you actually caught it. Yeah, we actually caught the Sasquatch. It, I was just going to say, I was wondering if it was almost a little disappointing. Like, like I know I never actually want to see a Sasquatch because I just like the idea that it's out there, but I don't know. I don't want to see I, one because I don't want to know that I saw one. Well, yeah, we also know you wouldn't shoot it. I wouldn't. So it'd probably kill you. 
So, you know, but, but anyway, so you've got that. I remember, you know, being in the first grade, I think I've even talked about this before, but birthday parties are a pretty big deal. You get invited to a birthday party, cake, ice cream. Maybe you're going to a movie. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's a sleepover, you know, uh, the best. And, and be like, oh yeah, Mark, it's my birthday. And I'm like, no, dude, I'm, I'm going to go deer hunting with my dad. It's deer season. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't care about the, the cake and ice cream. I'm going deer hunting. I remember in probably maybe a second grade, probably other kids had sports posters on their walls. I'd meticulously cut out pictures of caribou, mule deer, whitetail, blacktail, doll sheep. And I had them all in a row in my room. And it was like, and it's funny, I remember that that to this day, and, and I carry that with me to this day, because I'm like, someday I'm going to do that. Someday I'm going to do that. It was almost like these placeholders for experiences that I dreamed of having throughout my, like, someday I'm going to do this. And mm-hmm. I still, and some of those things I've marked off and want to do again, and some I have yet to do. Uh, but it's just, it was, I don't know, man, I can't explain it. It's just something so innate in me. My mom wasn't a big hunter. Not a giant fan of hunting, uh, you know, at the time, you know, probably because he wanted to avoid an argument. My dad kept his antlers in the garage, which, again, I'm in grade school. I'm like, uh, that's BS. So I brought them all inside, <laughs> put them up in my room. And, like, and so, like, you know, I mean, they were, weren't mine, but I was, I, I was somehow, you know, and even at the time, we'd never even gotten one. Like, I'd never seen an animal taken in person, but I was just captivated yeah. by, by the, by these horns and antlers that, mm-hmm. um, somehow I just knew were, and I guess it's going to sound like I'm, I'm placing like a, some sort of significance on, on, you know, antler size or something like that. But, um, e- even though they weren't mine necessarily, that they were still incredibly special to me and I was oh, yeah. fascinated by them. Yeah. Well, that's funny you say that when I was a, when I was a boy, um, I started trapping with my uncle and my grandfather and, and, and uh, trap muskrats and occasionally we catch a mink and uh, raccoons and things like this. And I, I got hooked up on furs. I loved animal hides. I thought they were the neatest things. There was a fur store in a uh, tannery and taxidermy shop at a town called Cosmos. It was like 20 miles from my house. Like three times a year, my mom would bring me there and she'd let, let me pick out hides. And so I'd get like a skunk or I'd get like a rabbit or like a possum or a beaver or something I didn't have or whatever. And I did the same thing. I hung them up on the wall. And it, my dad came home one day. Like, you're a kid. You don't understand that there's studs in the wall, and you can't just pound stuff into, con- or into sheep. I rock. still don't really understand how all that, that works, good. to be honest. Same. <laughs> and, so, and so, like, I raided, I think everybody's old man had this drawer somewhere in the house, and ours was in the laundry room. It was actually three drawers. I raided those drawers, and I found a smattering of various nails that were small in diameter. Some of them were large. Some might might have been like an 8D nail. Who knows? Oh, yeah, we had one of those. Yep. No, two of them. And it was it had like tape measures, glue, special tape that was different than masking one tape. One screwdriver where if you pulled it out, it would flip around and yep. it would be the other kind of screwdriver. Yep. And so I went through there, and I like found all these nails. Random, I hung up. Random outlet covers. Yeah. I hung every hide I had up on the wall. And like my grandpa taught yeah. me how to skin critters when I was like six. Uh, and so I skinned a bunch of chipmunks. I even had a couple of field mice and we backed them on felt, which is really funny. Uh, and squirrels and stuff. And I had them all over the wall. My dad came home just mortified because I put like 50 holes, some of which were like <laughs> a 16th inch <laughs> diameter, some of which were whatever the thickness of an 8D nail is all over the wall. And I had all these hides like arranged in a very particular fashion. And, and to your point, Mark, like some of them weren't mine. Most of them weren't mine. They were purchased somewhere. But like you, you said placeholder. That was a really good thing. Like I remember hanging up. I have a skunk hide. I still have the hide too, which is funny. Right. Mm. Striped skunk that I put on the wall. It's got the stamp from the tannery on it. I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a bigger skunk. Or I'm going to get a, a spotted skunk, which is different than that stripey, and I'm going to put it up there. And I'm going to get my own up there. And then I'm going to get like five of them. I'm going to put them on a ring and hang it on them. Yeah. And I was just, that was so funny. I, and another one, too, we used to go on family vacations all the time. And uh, my sister and I are very different. And my, my little brother is very different, too. He's like sports, academia. My sister's, she's a medical professional in academia. Like, I didn't care about any of it. All I wanted to do was be outside. And so we take our RV. My folks had a uh, 40 Conaline Travel Master. Nice. Yeah. 
huge. My dad locked me in the back, like the back room with the crappy doors, you know, because I had all these duck calls and grunt calls and stuff. As you were driving, you just, all you hear is just, oh. <laughs> yep. And, and like, I, like I everything kinda, rattles. I kind of like sneak squeaks. it out, you know, the rest of the family's up and like the, the living quarters of the RV mom's up in the, in the, you know, co-pilot seat and, and uh, sister and brother up kind of on the, the table or whatever. And I'm sitting, I like sneak out my little Susie double read and start squawking on my dad's like, no, no, get in the back. And I'd sit back there with a Walkman on and the, the cassette tapes oh, yeah. on how to blow duck calls and flip them over, you know, when you got done with it. And he's like, you know, put it up to your, your mouth. Here. Took a took a. And I just like, I had a whole collection of just how to call animals. And that, for no other reason, like I'd never done it. Oh, totally. Yeah. See, I, whenever, when I hear you guys talk about this, I can't help but think to myself, you know, a lot of what you're describing is stuff that just was born into you pretty much, right? Because you're explaining it almost from, like, infancy practically. Just as a kid, boom, it's there. And I, <clears throat> you know, we look, at, we look at the world today, and you see hunter numbers are in decline, and you see, you know, less people being interested in it. And it, it, makes, me, it makes me wonder, though. I know, I know a lot of people think as though interest in hunting is declining. And I think in some regards, maybe it is, but I, I wonder if actually there has always been throughout all of time, certain people that are just more wired to be hunters. Cause I think you look at, and, and this isn't, I'm not a historian, but I think you look at old, old timey things, like even, even back to, you know, the Bible is probably the most historic, like ancient history kind of thing I've read. Um, cause admittedly I'm not otherwise that interested, you know, and, and they talk about certain people of certain tribes that were like the hunter, like they mm-hmm. were a phenomenal hunter. Right. right. And I wonder if that person is the kind of person that was born similar to like what you guys are describing. And there were other people who probably hunted, but they weren't necessarily like if they could choose anything that they wanted to do, it would be to go hunting. You know what I mean? But nowadays in our society, it's not a, you don't have to go hunting to survive. You you expanded upon that, Ryan, when we first started. Like people don't have to go hunting to survive. So if you were born and that wasn't your thing, then you're sort of like, well, that's taken care of. The whole thing of like food and meat and like and and subsistence is taken care of. So I don't have to worry about that. And I don't have to go do it. I right. can go do my other interests. And so now what we're seeing is because people live in a more comfortable life where things that otherwise were subsistence things that had to be done are being done essentially for them, Mm -hmm. they're able to go and pursue things they enjoy. You also see it nowadays in people's in people's work. People say, do what you love. You know, if you find something that you love, you'll never actually work a day in your life. Whereas you look back even not that long, you don't have to go to ancient history to see where people used to work in just crap jobs. Mm -hmm. But it was like this is what I must do to provide for my family. And right. And nowadays it's so much like, do what you love. And so, you know, cause I think to myself, I was kind of born into this, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and got around hunting. I think the, the kinds of people who are probably like you guys, where you were, it was born into you that you love hunting. You, everything that you enjoy doing is uh, revolves around the outdoors and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people like that end up probably working for companies like Vortex or being involved with places like this. So then when I started working here, I was surrounded by it and I thought it was really neat and cool, you know, and I love, right. I love Vortex. I love everything that we do here. I, 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 and I genuinely love like when we went um, hunting, all three of us when hunting in Nebraska last year, that was some of the most fun I've ever had. Like one of the truly the most amazing experiences I have ever experienced. Um, a lot of experiences in there. Uh, was that time. And I enjoyed the days when we didn't see or the times we weren't seeing anything. I enjoyed the times when it was crappy and we were trudging through knee high snow up a steep hill that for some reason, like a uh, many thousand pound bison can just sort of like hop up like a bunny practically. <laughs> um, and that was fun. And I remember when we got back from that, I thought, oh, wow, okay, now I've been really immersed in this. This is going to take off. Like, this will be my thing. And 
I'm definitely more interested in it than I, or I, I, I should say I'm definitely more, um, what's the word? Uh, not chaotic. Chaotic's the wrong word. A little bit more crazy about hunting mm-hmm. than I was prior to that experience. But I've also gotten to the point now where now I'm back. I didn't stay at that high. I sort of reverted back to my thing that I feel was born into me right. was cars. Everybody knows right. that, right? Because I talk about it in every podcast. And so everything you guys are explaining of like when I was a kid, you know, you posted up pictures of stuff, you whatever, you remember every single moment that revolved around that thing. Mm-hmm. That's what you remember in your life. Like I remember Carol Shelby. I drew a picture of a Shelby GT500 Mustang when they came out with it. Uh, the new version based on the when Ford went retro with the Mustang in 2005 and a half. They went retro with the Mustang. A couple years later, they came out with the Shelby GT500. It was a huge, momentous occasion because they were coming back with the Shelby name. I drew one and I brought it to the Oshkosh EAA Air Show, and Carol Shelby signed my drawing. It's in my dad's office You're signed me. to this day. No, no way. Before he died. Amazing. I remember everything about that moment. I remember the fact that Carol Shelby was standing in front of the Ford tri motor plane. And I remember, like, what he looked like, what he was wearing. It was like a blue jacket with gray pants. And, like, I mean, everything about that moment. I was meeting Carol Shelby. And then I'd go home and just draw cars. Draw them. Yep. Constantly. Every day. I was drawing cars. Making up cars that I'd never seen before. Drawing them. Drawing cars that already existed. In all of my classes, if you look at my notebooks, because I've never been really much of a note taker, I just kind of, like listen and memorize and whatever, you know, some people are just like that. All my notebooks, car drawings, car drawings, car drawings. My dad saved all of them. And, uh, that's so cool. Yeah, but that's what it was. I'd play car video games all the time. I'd go to my brother Sam, who's been on the podcast before. He also likes cars, too. And I'd ask him everything about whatever car I was just racing in a video game. Just could not get enough. Car magazines, whatever. And to this day, if I have spare time... I am researching whatever it is there is to know about cars or like working on cars. So that's kind of what I reverted back to, even though I really loved hunting and it was super cool. Right. So that's where I wonder to myself, like this modern day and age, I almost, I almost wonder if what we're seeing is a decline in hunters overall, but you're almost seeing an increase in car enthusiasts. No, (laughs) no. Um, This is a bad word to use because I don't want to say that, hunters that maybe fell out of favor of hunting aren't quality hunters so but i'm saying an increase in an increase in the quality of hunters and i again like i said i'm putting that in air quotes because i can't think of a better word but just the hunters that are into hunting like they're into hunting because that was born into them yeah it's in their genetic code their dna they are hyper hunters whereas before what you had was people who are hunting because like well i guess i gotta do it and you're getting less and less of that now but it's it's trimming the trimming the fat a little bit. And again, now, geez, I've said low quality and fat when I'm referring to hunters that just aren't that into it. I'm referring in in a way to myself. Am I heavy, Jim? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 because you're, no. Anyway, but that's kind of what I'm wondering if if we're seeing happening. That was was a brilliant explanation. Uh, And I think part of it's exposure, too. (sighs) Okay, you brought up the exact word I was going to use. So I've got a a nephew. He'll be, uh, he just turned eight, so he'll be nine next August. He has zero interest in hunting. Mm-hmm. My brother-in-law is a fanatical hunter. Very was, I should say. He married my sister, and in that stroke of unfortunate, he's <laughs> <no>. <laughs> no. <laughs> Tom. If you're listening, I love you. Uh, anyway, my nephew does not really have any kind of draw to it, but I think it was really exposure. And it wasn't that I was overexposed to hunting, or maybe at just like some very critical points in my life. Right. I had the the right, like I said, my catalyst. But I also think to to your point, Jim. I think you're absolutely correct. Why are engineers engineers? Mm -hmm. Why are nurses nurses? Why are hunters hunters? There is some vestigial trait. But I wonder too, though, because sometimes you'll see hunters come on and get crazy into hunting late in life. I think it's it's the vestigial trait. I think it had to have been basically born into them. And finally, after probably, you know, and a lot of times they come from, the the people that you see come into it like crazy hard late in life. A lot of times they were born into a family where it was was like a faux pas to talk about hunting. Mm -hmm. And so they were sort of their, their innate vestibule whatever thing you said. Vestibule, that's (laughs) right. Yeah, vestibule. We have a couple of them in this building. Uh, Anyway, 
has now been able to like be freed. Oh, yeah. so usually no, they grow up, they get out of the house, whatever. They went to college. Now they're kind of it's separate. an awakening. They're able to sort of create their own life for themselves. Yeah, it is. You know, and, and you see that, you know, you see when, you know, a person who was a non-hunter, possibly even an anti-hunter, depending on what they were exposed to or, you know, opinions or thoughts or perceptions that had been, you know, uh, maybe uh, conveyed to them over time, whatever, what have you. And all of a sudden, you know, they have uh, somehow they, they get to that point where they either were a part of or had, you know, a positive hunting experience. And it's like one of those things where you, you see just like this, mm-hmm. this light Mm-hmm. You know, just all of a sudden, like you said, like I said, it's just like an awakening, and it's a beautiful thing. And oftentimes, you know, you almost you'll hear them make a comment like, "Like I can't, I can't believe I haven't been doing this my whole life." Right. Yeah. Right. And like almost like I waste, I can't believe I wasted this much time. Yeah. And then, like you said, but then I think, you know, they try to make up for it a little bit and <laughs> get think, super crazy yeah, into I, it, which I is think amazing. I that there's, there's probably also more than one reason that somebody may become fanatical about hunting, too. It doesn't necessarily have to be, let me get your guys' opinion on this, too, but it doesn't necessarily have to be this this predator instinct that's been put into them where it's like, no. must hunt. No. Because sometimes you see, too, and I genuinely, I genuinely believe that this is... Um, this is a great thing that we've seen as of late. I think that it's something that wasn't highlighted enough in the past, but yep. people bring up the organic food, you know, providing for yourself and your family with food that you know where it came from, you know, it was taken ethically, you know, whatever, you know, go down the whole list. Some people, that is what was born into them. Their their DNA says, I am a provider, you know, or I, I, am, I am into... Um, maximizing my health and, you know, efficacy as a human being and whatever. Maybe they're into, you know, CrossFit or just, you know, mountain biking or crazy high altitude, insane rock climbing. Yep. And so they must keep themselves at this optimal level of in shapeness. So, so hunting is a really cool outlet for them to do that and allows them to, you know, and then it also brings in good nutrition and stuff like that. Right. I think there's also those avenues. What do you guys think? Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. 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 You know. And, and, it, and it, it, I think, all comes back to what, what lives inside the, the man or the woman, um, n- not like the tiny person and they're pulling the levers, mm-hmm. but like the, the historical and the, um, the historical lineage of that person, like mm-hmm. what, what makes them them. It is. It's it's a, a trait left over from a long time ago. I think what's really cool amongst hunters, and I've said this before. I think uh, so. I was with with you when you shot that deer in Nebraska, yeah. and and it was. I think that was for me personally as high an emotional level as I felt about the successful take Ugh. of a game animal that I've ever had, even with my own, because it was something that was that was. I, well, it's so fresh, you know. It's like I'm not going to say I take it for granted. I don't particularly like to kill things in the first place, but you know, you go through the motions. You get you get fairly good at it and well versed at it. And you know, okay, I've taken an animal. Now I got to go take it apart and I got to get it out of here. And then I got to prep the meat. And then I got to package the meat. And I got to put it in my freezer. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the process is lined out because I've done it a few times. For you, it was completely raw, mm-hmm. like never been done before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then watching, and we were talking about this before the podcast. It was a terrible day outside it was insane yeah it was an absolute show the the blizzard was and walking in that blizzard and the deep snow and it was almost it was like this surreal environment and then you're getting these giant buffalo like standing up you know 50 yards away just staring at you Mm -hmm. really not flock of geese flies over yeah all this crazy stuff yeah, the buffalo seemed particularly annoyed with our presence, yeah. I felt. Um, we didn't ever charge or anything, but grouchy. they certainly didn't ever really run away. Um, it was just, it was, and then like you said, and then, then you just had this raw experience. And I've said it before when we've talked about this hunt, I didn't even buy a tag. You know, if we you know killed two deer right away, I probably would have bought a tag, right? Mm-hmm. But it was still one of the most, it was so fun because I didn't have a tag. Right. And to watch... Jim go through that, and then like you know, then we were uh, we, you know we didn't have a saw to get the ribs out, and I'm and I was like, ah man, I really you know really want to take these ribs. You don't have a saw. Jim's like, we'll get them out, you know. And <laughs> yeah. like Jim was leaving no part 
behind on that thing and just like just I don't know, man. That was, it was just so it was, cool. It was really, really, really special. But it was kind I, of a tribal experience, well, really. It was, it was, and that's I think I lost track of and and got in the weeds on that. But so, like I was saying, we could sit around a fire with any number of hunters from any any country, walk of life, tongue, bloodline, etc. We don't even point. have to speak the same language. No, nope. no. And we can be around this fire, and we can express our 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 happiness and our emotions and our triumphs and our failures through through hand gestures, voice inflection, and facial expressions. And we can, like, get the point across. And we can, we can illustrate our, our trophies and, and victories on the wall, you know, in charcoal if we want. And on that trip, when you had done that, you'd never done it before, and then immediately, like, you're indoctrinated to the club. Like, boom, there you are. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, like, your membership is signed, sealed, delivered, and, and highlighted. And I think what was even the best part about it is afterwards you ate that entire deer in like three weeks. <laughs> it did go um, fast. And luckily you saved one piece. I did. I had to actually have my wife hide a piece. Yeah. And and it was like it was like that it worked. It worked. It was like a, a very interesting thing to see somebody who is otherwise a conventional non hunter become a hunter mm-hmm. and and like completely amass it. And while maybe you didn't like propel upward and outward with the frequency that or, or mania or, or craziness that some people do. But I think it still comes down to exposure. Yeah. Well, and, the thing and is, also though, like, I'm sure like, even though like, um, uh, like you understood hunting before that. Right. Yeah. But I'm sure you probably have a like greater here. understanding. Oh yeah. I, I understood. I've like, as with many things in my life. I've had to understand vicariously, you know? So yeah. it's like, Everything I learned about cars, I learned vicariously through somebody else who was a mechanic who put up YouTube videos. You know, so a lot of things I was learning were through a lot of people around here at Vortex. But yeah, once you get to experience it for yourself, it's totally different. And since then, I have got, you know, so like went turkey hunting in the spring. And, you know, I did get that coming home, I remember, and seeing a freezer full of vacuum sealed bags with a deer that I harvested and like had shot and seen through the scope a lot. I mean, it, it was so many emotions and it was so cool to have that there. I still remember actually too, like sitting there and having only pulled the trigger a number of times where there was steel or paper in the scope and then seeing a deer. That was one thing that I underestimated. I thought I'd be able to just kind of like, put the reticle on the target and pull the thing. Right. But I remember that I was actually a point, I don't know if you guys really noticed it, but there was a point where the deer was standing completely broadside, totally oh, yeah. still, and I had a shot at it and it was there and I could have pulled the trigger, but I like, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to kill it. Um, but it was just like a, wow, this is happening. Yeah. And then, yeah, I didn't and he moved. Well, and also and then we had to adjust. Well, and let me let me ask this question: Was it while this is happening? But along with that, like, I mean, bad shots happen, right? That, but yeah. uh, but also like, well, there's like there's more of a consequence. There's a consequence if I screw this, this up. That's what it was. And because when I go and shoot at paper, you're sighting in a rifle, right? You don't sight in rifles on a deer or on a living thing, right? Unless you're a sicko. But anyway, you don't sight in rifles on a living thing. You just kind of. You put it up, you bore sight, and it's like, well, I probably won't hit the target, but we'll see where this, hopefully <laughs> it's close. Oh, yep, I'm a little off. With that, it's like, oh, wait, this is one shot. Like, mm-hmm. make it work. But, yeah, and then taking it home, like I was getting into a little bit, too. Uh, taking it home, and the most memorable meal that I had was first night opening up the heart. And watching a YouTube video as to how to get the, you know, how to fillet it all up. Pour and, out the yeah. ventricles. And I was yeah. I was a very much quintessential medium kind of guy when I came to my stakes and things. And I was I was thought to myself, nope, like that's not gonna happen here. This is gonna be rare. And I'm just gonna eat it that way. I remember feeding a little bit to my dog and you know too and like <laughs> a little like bit to my dog and thinking to myself like, I hope you like deer. <laughs> What's awesome is like you just ex- you just describe full circle of man's domestication. Oh, of dogs. seriously? <laughs> like, yeah, so, yeah, like, yeah. so like right right there in your home, like the whole thing kind of came together. Yeah, and it is so it is so fantastic, and and I think it is exposure. I think if if it's you a stuck huge to part of it, it's like a workout regimen. If you stuck to like I'm gonna hunt 
three times a year, my mm-hmm. first three years of hunting. Mm-hmm. And you like tried some different flavors. So you did turkey, you did uh, the cast and blast up on <clears throat> in northern Wisconsin with, with the, the ducks, the fish, and the geese. And you, you went attempt out deer hunting. The, well, right. Valiant attempt. Uh, you went out deer hunting the other day. I think like you keep on that path and it will, it will become, I'm not going to say it's going to consume you. Mm-hmm. But it's going to become a part of you, or you're going to become a part of it, or the two of you are going to run in, in tangent and parallel yeah. together. The one thing I find, though, that I feel is that I, I, I want it to become more of a thing, but there's, there always feels as though for me, there's a little bit of a block. Oh, there's always confliction. And, and perf- perfect example. Is that like a use of your time block? Like, oh, I could rebuild this engine, or I could go deer hunting, I choose the yeah. engine? Actually, yeah. Okay. I think that is. So like I think to myself there's I have this really romantic idea in my head that you know I'll have kids someday and those kids I'll be able to take out hunting, they'll really enjoy hunting. I want to keep the tradition of hunting and and just the the sport and all of it whatever alive. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well if I want to do that and 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 do it the way that I in my vision it works out, then I need to hunt more because I would like myself to be a little bit more of a resource than just sort of like, ah, yeah, I don't know, just go out there and sit and hope something walks by. You know, I want to be mm-hmm. able to have woodsmanship, understand what to tell them, a little bit of like, I think it's always amazing when I've walked out in the woods and like you two, especially Ryan here, you know, is, oh, well, this is this kind of a tree and it it blossoms in this month. And the interesting thing right. about this is that cavemen used to, use this tree for, you know, a signal to their, who knows what. Uh, <laughs> just throwing that together. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, so that I've always thought is cool, but but every time I kind of try, there's the block of, I, I'll be honest with you, it, it, it is cars. Right. Because I, I think this is something I think is cool and I like doing, but the thing that I love and that I can never get out of my head is cars. Right. So I feel like I can only ever take it so far. And I think that's, like you said, that's a, and maybe it's, that's an early exposure thing too. I think right? it is. Like, I, and so like, you're kind of like your path, that's how your path was shaped. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe that's why I, th- I think maybe that's probably like a natural human thing. Like you learn from your family, you know what I mean. That's probably why yeah. you got some families that are like, yeah, we're a family of shoemakers, right? Yeah. We're we're a family of this, whatever, you know, over over eons of time. Um, and eventually, man has to crawl out of the woods, right? Yeah. And so maybe like you were just a, a, ahead of that already, and you'd been out, but now you're wandering back. It could have been, yeah, but yeah, I just think the other thing that I have a problem with too is is patience, and it probably goes into the what I was just talking about is patience in the woods. Patience is really hard. Like, oh yeah, hunters that are really good hunters are really good at being patient. And with me, I think one of the reasons I really love, for example, and we'll talk about that Nebraska hunt again. Um, I love that hunt because there's a ton of pressure from other hunters around. The weather was awful, and we had to move a lot. So there was never a chance for my mind to be like, eh, I'm bored. I'm going to think about cars. Well, and it was new to all of us, too. That, that at least very that Very new, spot. very new place, very beautiful, scenic, picturesque. So we moved to a spot, and I like my, with my personality, and I think it's my personality with a lot of things, too. It's not even just hunting or just cars or anything. Just my personality is sort of like, oh, that didn't work. Let's try another thing. That didn't work. Let's try another thing. That didn't work. Let's try another thing. I never quite get to the point where I'm like, that didn't work. I'm done. I quit. It's just, let's try another thing. So we'd go to one spot, and we'd sit there for like, 15 minutes, and I'm thinking to myself, already, where's the next place we can go? Like, look at my Onyx. Okay, where, where do we go? I bet they're going to be over here. And, and then Ryan while, and I, two hours later, go, where'd Jim go? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you guys, I mean, after 15 minutes, you guys are basically, like, just now finally settled in. And I'm like, let's go, you know? And luckily, we're, the way that things were working out in on that hunt, we kind of had to be really mobile. Oh, yeah. You couldn't sit in one spot yeah, we, for very long. We could face like an imminent death. <laughs> <It was laughs> yeah. <kind of> <laughs> So we, we stayed really mobile, and that, that was really fun for me. So I've, I've found, too, that now when I look at hunts or I think about hunts that I think would be really cool to go on, um, which is I know we have a hunt plan to go on here soon, coming up that we'll reveal soon, that is probably going to be brutally patience-requiring for me. But It could. I think about hunts where it's 
where I'm I'm thinking, where's a hunt where I can basically always be on the move? I can almost even just be able to finally, when I see a deer, chase it down and like jump on its back and wrestle it to the ground. Why didn't you tell me this three days ago? We could could have done deer drives together. <laughs> <laughs> I see a Hawaiian uh, hog hunt in your future. That sounds yeah. awesome. In, that's the jungle, what in the jungle with a knife. Traditional. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's one way. No, it, it, uh, that, that's really funny. You know, when I was a youngster, I remember sitting in the deer stand the first time. And I, I think for the same reason that you just highlighted is why I'm not uber enamored with stand hunting whitetails and why I hunt them either like just on the ground or out West, uh, or not at all is, is it was, it was like after about an hour and a half, it was like, boy, this is rough. Nothing's coming. Nothing's going to come. I just can't take it anymore. Oh, and when uh, it's and when it's archery season too, you don't hear in the distance the right. Nobody at least implies. Oh well, there's at least something there are out here. deer yeah. out here. It, and you know, and, it's it's all different though. Like I find, like I love it. Like I, f- but, I don't find it boring at all. Look in at, fact, look I, at, I find it completely meditative. And I love the fact, you know, and, and this, this is getting back to like I, f- I love just as you do and I'm sure you do too Jim just like the natural world is just like mm-hmm. um, infinitely fascinating and one thing as I've gotten older one thing I try to do is like which is hard because you're so focused on the hunt and you're so focused even in the stand you're focused on listening or what's the wind doing or that you know uh, did I hear something was that uh, but I, I, I've been trying to um, when a bird lands like three feet away from my face. And even though, like, I think a deer might be coming, I know I should be watching for a deer. I'm trying to be better at taking a break and being like, I need to appreciate the fact that I'm in this really cool spot right now and it's super quiet. I'm the only one here and there's this beautiful bird like three feet away and I'm going to pay attention to its feather detail and the sounds that it's making and be appreciative that, like, it's so freaking awesome. Yeah. That it's yeah. just, like, yeah. not caring that I'm here right Consider now. Consider the chaos in your life, though. Like... Every other day, like you have children, you, you know, job, commute, traffic, bills, etc. As I've grown older now, now I've I've gotten away from that impatient mindset, <clears throat> and and now it's like I can handle just sitting, and, okay, and like being okay with it now. But the for, other, for the hours. The other thing yeah. is too, though, is that okay? Let's say you got a free day. Yeah. What would you do in that day? Hunt. Hunt. Exactly. I'd be in a garage underneath the car. So we'll get that, you there. That's where it's like that's where I think when when people who have a thing and they're like particularly just driven towards that thing. And I actually think there's a lot of people out in the world who don't have a thing yet too. And and they're just waiting for it to be unlocked, you know? Because there's a lot of people probably out there, I don't know if any of them will be listening to this podcast, probably not, but they just kind of go through their day. This is this is kind of I guess one of the things that I've never really understood. There's some people that wake up in the day and I don't know if they have a thing they're shooting for. Yeah. Like, like if what? if I if I had a free minute, I will try and research how a um like how manual transmission works. Mm-hmm. Right. I'll look it up. I I've looked that up so many times. I've, I sit already. by you, Jim. I'm pretty sure I saw you look that up. Yeah. Yeah. Or like how a differential works. How do I install a limited slip diff in an open diff? Whatever. If I have a free minute, I will do that. Because that is, every day I wake up, I'm like, that's what I want to do. My every, every ounce of my goal in life is to just find some time where I can finally be done with life and just live in a garage underneath right. a vehicle. You know what like, I think you, you should do? You go to work and you love work. And, yeah, I do and love you're good work. at it. I do love work. Yeah. And you love Vortex. I do love Vortex. This isn't, yeah, this isn't me but saying also, I don't, yeah. but But that also is a means... To do yeah. what you're passionate about. You yeah. should put the but two there, together. But there are some people, well, we should, yes. There are some people, though, where I think they like, they get it and they're like, if they had a minute of free time, they would be like, what do I do? I guess I'll go on Instagram. Yeah. You know, even, but I think that those people are waiting to, there could be hunters out there. They right. could have something in their DNA that says, oh my gosh, if I was out here, they'd be like, I need to do this more. Even yeah, Eeyore. This is all I ever want to do. Even Eeyore had a plan. As, as dreary and droopy as he was, and it was just to live in that little rebuild his little stick shack. <laughs> he did. But, but you're but right. Yeah, that's that's why I think some people, you know, like the hunters are able to have better patience because when things settle down, when they don't have to be worried about bills, work, you know, whatever, kids, s- dumb stuff, 
you know, like mm-hmm. uh, stupid like toothpaste, <laughs> deodorant, whatever. Um, <laughs> Dumb hygiene. Yeah, exactly. When they don't it have to worry so about that freeing. stuff, then their mind is on hunting. And if you're hunting, then you're in everything. That, that's where I think everybody's like, when people talk about like, oh, I'm in my chi, whatever. I think it is because the thing that you always think about doing, you are also doing. You're like in a vacuum of... You are. There's nothing else. Yeah. But as soon as you're either doing something that isn't what you're always thinking about, then you're distracted. Or if you're thinking about something or, or, or if you're doing the thing that you're always thinking about, but in this particular instance, something else is happening in life where your mind is elsewhere, mm-hmm. then you're distracted. Yep. But you're like, great place to be. Anyway, so that's why I think, that's, that's my theory on why I think some just hunters... The egg Can hasn't been cracked. Such yet. good patience. Yeah. I, I'm going to back up a little bit because I said earlier that like I don't have a need to go out and get meat in the field, and I didn't like mean that. Like I don't personally have a need to. I, I should have. I guess I was um, compartmentalizing myself with with the modern human. Um, you ever had wagyu beef? I think yeah. It's inc- it's incredible. It's very delicious. It's ex- I probably would have known if I had. Yeah, it. I don't so know if I, I have or it. not. I mean, it's like really, really, really expensive. Yeah, I'm sitting there. I took a nice antelope this year, and I, I'm supposing I netted about 40 pounds of meat off of it. Right, it's what you get off of pronghorn. Mm-hmm. And if I tried to like associate a, a dollar per pound cost of this antelope, wagyu would likely have been more affordable. <laughs> I will never go out and buy wagyu beef to eat it because you're thinking about the gear that it took, the gas money. Oh that yeah, it took, the... it's heinous. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's, it's interesting though. Like, yeah, you look at the price of that, and it just seems completely asinine. Yeah, yeah like, but correct. a lot. And then, oh, of course, never in a million years would I spend that much money for some meat. And of then course, a like, lot yeah, of people. The antelope hunt. Yeah, I'm about two grand deep on that correct. forty pounds of meat. A lot of people only look at it as you know the cost of the tag. You know, so they're kind of mm. like, man, can you believe we got all this meat for just the cost of a tag, which is 125 bucks or something? Mm. And that's a little bit. That's a little bit unrealistic, right? <laughs> oh no, man! I'm looking at doing a hunt this fall, and I. For some reason, I forgot about it because I did it before and forgot how expensive it was. And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, it won't be that bad. And I'm like, okay, yeah, the tag's about a G. The plane ride's going to be a G. I'm like, yeah, I've got mm. like two parts of it and I'm two Gs deep. And yeah. when, like, yeah, when I when I look at people who do the 24 hours of lemons where they have to build a race car that lasts 24 hours for less than 500 bucks net, and then somebody's like, oh, look at this build we're doing. And the car is on a five thousand dollar two post car hoist, and they're using a five hundred dollar engine puller and engine leveler and load leveler and engine stand and pneumatic tools. And I'm like, yeah, no. I think this podcast was supposed to start about like why we hunt, but really it became to like why we are passionate. Yeah, I do have. Well, they have the yeah. Isn't that why you hunt, though? Yeah, but it's more than that, though, because you're passionate about cars. And, and I've been bet, talking about I've, that this entire time. I apologize. No, it's. I think it was actually quite brilliant. Why do you hunt? I'm Let me tell you draw, about cars. Well, I'm trying to draw a parallel, though, because I know a lot of people, because you guys are getting into the thing that's passionate. I think what I was trying to get at is that if anybody who's a big-time passionate hunter says why they hunt, I could almost say why they hunt for them without them having to say anything. You know what I mean? You you hunt because you love it, you're passionate about it, you enjoy the outdoors, you enjoy the animals, you enjoy the meat, you and your dad did it when you were a kid, whatever. I could almost list off all the reasons. And so and so that's where I was trying to get into like Well, you have all those same things, Jim. Just substitute the word right, car. Exactly. And so that's that's where I'm saying that's where I'm saying, um just because maybe you don't have that same feeling about hunting doesn't make you broken. I think some people make the idea of hunting seem like, well, I don't get it. It's it's innate to humans. Like it's in our DNA as humans. We're predators. Yes, we are, but I still think even when you go back to those really, really caveman esque days, I still think there were probably some cavemen who really enjoyed hunting more than others. Oh, but yes. the others just did it because they had this to. This is why we have agriculture. Yeah. This is eventually why we made a wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Two great things. That's a good point. Well, let me, uh, I, I, you did that's, bring up something earlier, Jim, that, that made me think about it, though, and, or we talked about it a little bit as far as, like, you know, hunting at one point in time, definitely necess- necessity, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. You better, 
have known how to hunt and been a good hunter, or at least known some, right? Or you're dead. True. For a fairly extended period now. Not as essential, in fact. There are some we'll folks say, out there who yeah. still do, but yeah, you know, but um we at least in our modern first world, like we talked about, um, not a necessity could get by without it. And I wonder if if over time, you know, we talk about like this innate thing of like uh, or even just maybe the genetic part of it. Like, you know, the good hunters probably survived, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you're a good hunter, or you weren't, and if you're a good hunter, you lived. Yeah. Well, now we haven't really had to do that, right? So Not for urban, the past, you like, don't, right. Urbanization, you don't, refrigeration, yep. all these different things have made it... Right, so what I'm saying, what I'm getting at here is like, we've had a few hundred years where you don't have to be a good hunter to survive. Mm-hmm. You don't have to know a good hunter to survive, to proliferate. So it's almost like... Maybe we've uh, thinned out right. this yeah. somewhat, genetic, somewhat devolved. Yeah, I didn't say that as eloquently as I wanted to, no, or, as, I, or as I had planned in my head. But kind of like I was getting at earlier too, though, the ones that you see that are still really big into hunting, though, you have to you have to think to yourself that that those people are doing all that in spite of all the resources that they mm-hmm. have nowadays. Mm-hmm. So you, mm-hmm. those people must. I'm not saying they're the greatest hunters in history, by any means, because I have no idea. I don't know how you define that. I though. have no idea. What, what, right? do, you, what do you but define they, that by? They must be. They must have it. In. Ah, uh, yeah. Encoded. I, I think there's a few people that are just like you know, almost like Michael Jordan's it's, of hunting. It's wrapped yeah. around their spine and it has a hold on them. Like it is. Like I think it has a hold, and I think they almost have like a next level. Yeah, six sense, sense. And I think, sense yeah. sensibility. I think it's kind of it's a little bit unrealistic for everybody to think that they're going to be like that. No, correct, you know? absolutely not. Even yeah. as much as you may want to be like that, as much as when I was a kid and I played basketball, I wanted to be like Michael Jordan. I thought all I had to do was practice, 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 and I could have gotten really good. Did but you? I the- don't think I ever would have be- been Michael Jordan. Oh, don't give up yet. <laughs> still got to grow another six <laughs> inches, but um, still waiting on that late blossom. But you know, there's there's something That's there's a good something TV show. about that blossom. Something about certain people where they just have an extra thing. Yep. About it, and you can if you're somebody else who just doesn't have the thing, you can work and work and work and work and work and work, and you get probably pretty dang close. But you you probably never quite get to that level. Right. And the other thing is, you have to consider to yourself. You have to think to yourself. If I'm the kind of person that needs to. You know, and I, I don't want to take away from anybody who has that natural thing and say that they've never worked for it, right? Right? You know, a lot of those people, they do work, so it's just compounding on top of the already natural mm-hmm. innate ability they have. But I also wonder to myself sometimes when I think about, um, okay, if I'm the kind of person where in order to get up to this person's level, I have to work and work and work and work and work and work so, so, so hard, devote, like, all this time, all this effort to get close, then I feel like, I'm probably have another thing in my life that I'm actually, I could be that person of that thing where it's, I actually have an innate ability elsewhere that I could work in and be super good at better than most other people could be good at it. How much in this it, other area? And I probably also think about that a lot. So, so why would I necessarily, how much of this there's is, a sweet spot of how much time I should devote to that thing. I how much know. of this is mindset though? I pr- a lot like of I, th- I think about the the term professional hunter, and I'm not talking about like <clears throat> like you know turn of the century or, or late 1800s Africa. Uh, I, I, I'm talking like the guys that that this is where gear companies and and rifle companies and and optics companies and boot companies are making stuff for those guys. Uh, what I if, think that's a made up word by people that. Anyway, professional hunter. Well, okay, so I'm, trying, I'm like, this is your job, more or less. Yeah, but still, I don't know, man. The only people that are a PH or a professional hunter, in my opinion, are um, PHs in Africa, and that's just because what they call guides. Okay, so <laughs> I think you know where I was going, though. So Jim, Jim, made, he's, he's like, I had, I would have to work, 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 work to maybe get as good as them, but maybe I'm already this good. Is it just mindset, though? Are you maybe are you maybe putting that individual or individuals on a pedestal that you feel unachievable because it's not something that you've been exposed to? So if I if I revert back to my youth and I think about myself as a seven year old duck hunter, 
with a single shot 20 gauge like having aspirations for huge volumes of decoys and boats with lights and semi-automatic shotguns. Yes. Like eventually I got there. I don't recall having to work that hard to get there. It just kind of happened. Mm -hmm. But it was through exposure. Yeah. Like how much of it are you teeing yourself up at at, at the beginning with, yeah, it's a lot of work, but I'm probably pretty good at this. Uh, like are you dismissing yourself too early? Well, no, I guess I guess what I'm trying to get at isn't necessarily like, like uh, it's a lot of work, I give up. It's, it's kind of what I was, what I was thinking is I see, you know, everybody talks about, you know, Running time from the grizzly bears hard, uh, <laughs> give up like time, time is probably the most invaluable resource on the, in the planet. Yeah. You, you don't have a lot of it. You don't no. have a lot of it. It is, there is no more valuable resource on the planet aside from probably air yeah. and light, air, light, and time, I think are maybe the three most valuable resources on the planet. Anyway, um, breathable air, I should say. So if I'm thinking about if I'm thinking about how much time I want to devote to becoming like a really good hunter, you know, if I have a certain finite amount of time I can devote to becoming really good at something, I tend to want to devote as much of that time to the thing that I'm already naturally good at and I naturally think about a lot and just have this thing about my DNA that makes me really love that thing. Devote more time over there. That doesn't mean I'm giving up on anything else that I also think is cool. So this is kind of the struggle that I have sometimes where my free time and anything like that I want to devote to getting really good at cars and stuff. It doesn't mean I want to give up on hunting or not devote any time to it, but I just need to I need to smartly, which isn't a smart word to say, devote I'll take I'll take it though. <laughs> I devote my uh, a sweet spot of time to hunting yeah. where I get what I want out of hunting in terms of enjoyment, in terms of connection with nature, in terms of hopefully harvesting some of my own meat. I really enjoy that. All these things about hunting, I need to devote a smart amount of time to that where I'm getting what I want out of it, but I don't have too high of expectations. Because sure. if, I, if I were to just drop everything right now and be like, I will hunt every single hour of every single day that I can to just be amazing at it, I would, I would feel... Don't get me wrong, I'd love it, right? But I'd also still feel a little empty because I'm like, there's this thing over here that I actually really probably like a little bit more. Do you think it would do you think it would ever pick or do you think the the the, the hunting would eventually outweigh the other passion? It's hard to say. I think maybe it's possible, but there there is something about I'm really excited to watch this experiment. There is something about like a hard wiring, you know? Yeah. And it, oh yeah. Because yeah. when you when you explain when you explain you as a kid doing, you know, single shot, 20 gauge, whatever, being in boats, being around these people, doing these things. A lot of the stuff, and when we talk about cartridges on this podcast too, and some of you in high school developing, you know, cartridges with your shop teacher and stuff like that, I think to myself, I'm, our, I'm at a significant disadvantage in terms of time and experience as you are, and I can try and catch up, but while I'm trying to catch up, you're not going to stop. You know, so if I'm always idolizing where you're at, then I'm always going to be just trailing behind does that well, that's well like, yeah because sense, at the, it, on the same side of the coin, i'm like man if i knew how to work on my own truck i could probably pull that dent that white tail put in it the other day and jim knows how to do that real good <laughs> well, that's I, true like i'm why never spent time oh yeah mark's over here with his tires <laughs> mark and mark didn't change his tires after they had already exceeded probably legal <laughs> limits for balding uh he waited about a year after that to actually I, change his tires i told you guys repeatedly when the wires stick out that just gives you more traction yeah, that's true. He's it's not kind of wrong. like it's kind. Well, he he is correct, but it's also sort of like when a bolt reaches maximum strength right before it breaks. <laughs> I think that's what it's like. Your tires, your tires, as they go completely bald, they have this one last. Oh, we got a little bit more grip. It's interesting anyway. though, because I'm like I'm like Jim. You should hunt more. You should hunt more. You should hunt more. Like you just need to hunt more and do cars less. And you're probably thinking the same thing. Like Mark, if you would just start working on cars yeah. more, you'd have a bigger yeah. interest in but working like, on cars. And I'm like, why well, don't I have time to work on cars? Because I'm never gonna get. I'm never gonna be able to dedicate enough time to learn how to work yeah. on cars to be able to yeah. be able to do it confidently and, and be good at. Yeah. It. And I didn't actually start wrenching on stuff until about two and a half years ago. And now I've done jobs that involve like pulling engines and replacing entire suspensions, entire underbody restorations. Whereas 
I've kind of been interested in hunting and kind of been around it now for about maybe like three quarters that long. And I'm nowhere near. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, but it still saying? comes down to experience. But I still love hunting. Yeah, it, it still comes it's down so, to experience. I know we're I know we're talking about why we hunt. Now we're discussing sort of like is it worth it almost to try hunting? You know, if you're not one of these people who's innately uh, wired to hunt, yeah. I still think it is worth it to hunt. I'm I'm also just I think I think one of the things I think you're struggling right now. I <laughs> maybe I maybe I am conflicted. What I've yes. seen what I've seen sometimes is sort of a little bit of sh- <clears throat> shaming out there of people who don't quite. Take hunting whole, like, just friggin' Oh, yeah. The whole thing. Yep. Like, a little bit of shaming. You yep. know, like, oh. Oh, gosh, you, I'd hope You not. don't spend every single day of of the season outside, like, trying to go out or whatever. Or you don't, um, oh, you buy meat at the grocery store? Meat shaming, I call that. It's, it's like, yeah. Anyway. I do, I do it. I was going to say, me I, too. I look at my sister, and I'm going to pick on her because I can. What are you doing? You could be feeding your kids antelope or mule deer or something. I, but, but so you know, this has also brought something else. I derailed to like, us a lot. I love hunting everybody. No, it's been so. <laughs> I know you do. It's, it's been it's been really cool because isn't it interesting? Like the uh, the people that you form a group with, like will all have a certain skill set or or possibly a passion set, and you form like probably a better, stronger community. Oh so, yeah, if everybody was good at the same thing. Yeah, we would actually get in contention with each other, and, and eventually we'd be worried about somebody in, yeah. encroaching on our our. Well, not products. only that, but there'd yeah. be nobody to work on my car, so I could go hunting. Correct, and so I, I think this has also been kind of an interesting human experiment um, because now we have uh, it's it's kind of like the ultimate team. We've got you know a hunter, uh, we've got a gatherer, we've got a mechanic. We're doing good. <laughs> We're, it's not bad. When it when it really goes south, yeah. I think we should well, be pretty well. Let's set. look at let's look at again. Sort of people always talk about hunting as this tribal thing. Hunting wasn't the only thing that happened in mm-hmm. tribes. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. So you had somebody had to grow like, the plants. You, somebody you had, had to fix the spears. Somebody had exactly. to. Yeah. Okay. And that's wow. how that's how things work. So when you talk about when you talk about tribal and people talk about oh it's this instinct within human beings. It is one of many instincts that human beings have had for a long time. And I think I think hunting is right up there as probably, and this is where I'll come back to saying, it may be, I think it's the most important instinct that humans have ever had in history. Because people might say, what about inventions, right? What about the industrial revolution? What about the railroad, the vehicle? Last I checked, humans were surviving for at least, it's still yet to be determined, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years without these things. So they had that. But they did still, even back then, come up with inventions. There was the classic fire. There were spears. <laughs> there, were, there were unique bows. I mean, when you look back at... The, cla- the, classic. the classic fire. I'll, I'll tell you what. You know, an all-time classic, my book, is fire. <laughs> Great invention. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's a classic. <laughs> I tell you what, another one I did. like is the water. Uh, <laughs> but you can't, you can never have had any of these inventions without food, You're right. and that's what hunting was for, right. always originally for food and clothing too. Mm-hmm. So all of the th- all of the things, uh, agriculture, um, like I said, inventions, just whatever else. What, I mean, what else is there besides? Nothing. Food? I mean, food you said the fire. Besides I mean, inventions and food. That's it. But you can't you can't do any of that stuff without right. having hunting. So. I think hunting is probably the most important instinct that humans have in history. And it's I, it's and a strong so, one, but like you said, you know, maybe some people, you know, you, I think you, and it probably does happen. You know, you have this kind of like this instinct or this this DNA to either a greater or lesser degree, and it'd be interesting to if you could like you know do just a really in depth twenty three and Me and go back and find mm-hmm. them like oh why don't I why don't I love to hunt I mean and I'm not saying you specifically but just like yeah. just a person like I guess I'm I'm just not into it and then you go back and you're like oh that's because like you're my missing roots, number one fifty six Y well not that, not that gene not that but you go right back there. to the tribe and you're like oh I guess we're berry pickers right that, that was our job it wouldn't would that be suck though like, if we were we were the be- we were really awesome berry pickers <laughs> if you could if you could know why you are the way you are that'd be so cool would it though. It was like knowing your expiration date. Oh, would you know that though, if you knew the way you? No, are? I mean, like, if you're like, like your why? Why do I have this innate desire to hunt? And it's very hard to define. Like you said, you could probably give the cursory, like, e- exemplifications as to why I hunt. 
Yeah. But you could never, and I don't even know if I could it's just like, articulate what it is. Uh, the best way I can put it is they're going to put me in the ground one day. Yeah. And if I don't do it, I will have wasted my life. And that's the time thing. Yes. That is the time thing, right? Yeah. And that's that's kind of what I was getting at is you got to figure out where you want to spend your time. And right. you got to you got to if you're everybody has a thing. Yeah. But there's other things that interest them and you just got to devote a smart amount of time to the other things that still allow you to do the thing that you really love. Um but what you're just getting at too, I think it's funny cuz you you sometimes hear people where I'm going to speak just to guys now, but you ask a guy, like, well, what do you love about your wife? And you're like, well, uh, she's beautiful, she's funny, she's smart, she's witty, she makes me smile. Every guy says that. Every single guy on the planet. And it's like, do we all marry the same girl? No. It, it, there's something that you can't explain about just, like, why out of 3.5 billion or however many number of people on the planet there are, I just saw my wife and I was like, that one. Yep. You know, yeah, that's where interesting. then sort of the same thing is when you were born and you went out in the woods for the first time with your grandpa or your dad or your mom or grandma or brother or whoever else, and you got up in a tree or you waited somewhere or you glassed something and you maybe even didn't even see anything, but you were just out there. You were just like, yep, this is what I want to do forever. Yep. This is what I love doing. This is my thing. Peace out, everything else. Yeah. I There's got to be something about that. That's interesting. I sometimes feel... I guess sorry or I don't know like sorry that's kind of a that's, I I wonder about people that live deep in cities that are immersed only in that life that have big fancy high rise penthouses that go to parties and then they process repeat mm-hmm. and I think to myself like how lonely it must be true but then then you frame it that way that you did and like maybe that's just their thing i just could never put myself in the headspace of being somebody with a penthouse a helicopter oh and like jet setting to morocco i think there are people who that's their thing but i think there are people who are doing that because people that they think are pretty neat and successful are doing it and they think they should too and that's that's where i also get into like if anything has ever even made you double take you know um, aside from like hard, crazy drugs, I'm not going to get into that here, but you know, but like anything in the world has ever just made you give it like well, a hard, I'm, like I'm a, glad you're off that ride, like a Jim. double take or whatever. It's like, try it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And cause if you don't, how do you know? How do you ever know? How do you ever know? Like, uh, uh, Eddie here does boxing. Yep. Right. Yep. Guy came from New Jersey, came over to Wisconsin, was feeling a little bit glum, kind of didn't really like the way that he was, uh, didn't like his health, felt like he could look a little bit better. And the guy just decided, you know what? I, I heard about this boxing thing, kind of a big thing back in Jersey or whatever. You know, I felt like I always got picked on as a kid, so whatever it was. And he's like, I'm going to go and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this boxing thing. Next thing you know, guy is a in certified boxing instructor. Yeah. Just because he tried That's it. That's so crazy. Had you not done anything like that, you know? Um, uh, Jim, has he instructed anybody you know? Uh, um, just, I don't know, some, some pretty, just some kid Jim. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if you don't, if you don't try these things, so that's, that's where too, I think when it comes, when it comes to honey, I do think everybody should at least, it's a classic thing for me to say, right? Everybody should try it, you know? And then the, and then the inevitable question is, cool. Sounds good to me. How? If we found a bunch of podcasts. Call us. Call us. Yep. Please. Yeah. Oh, um, we love talking about that. We do. We do. Man. But uh, you, you never know. You could strike something that is way down deep in your DNA. Yes. And maybe just, boom. Maybe it's something you don't even know about. You know, that's what I think. You talk about some folks that, you know, we'd go back to exposure and you've lived in, you know, the city, which there's nothing wrong with cities, right? Lots of people live in cities. But, um, man, you just, you just got to wonder if it's in them. Mm-hmm. And they just don't know. They don't even know. Yeah, you know, like they, the they don't. They world. don't know that potentially mm-hmm. they might be living what they would find out, right? Mm-hmm. And this might be extreme, but like an unfulfilling life. Sometimes I wonder, you know, when you see actually, you you bring this up, and I'm thinking now. You walk around some cities. When when I'm in a city, usually like in town, it's for okay. I'm gonna go catch a catch dinner, catch a movie, get out. 
sometimes you go into a city though and there's people hanging around and you see them like in the park and you wonder to yourself, why are you, why'd you go to the city to go to a park? Right. Right. Like, is there something in you that really loves being out in nature? Right. And it's like, why don't you try the real stuff? Yeah, you're craving something. The right. bigger one. Right. Yeah. yeah. The, the real one. Stuff. Yeah. Those oh, trees that's were interesting. Those trees were meticulously spaced in place there. You know, they they grow at random over there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we were, uh, when I was up in Alaska this last uh, spring, we were, my buddy was talking about a person that he was up in that same part of the country with. And this uh, lady was just, she was in awe of the fact that they were able to plant the trees uh, so perfectly and spaced so closely together up there. She she couldn't believe how somebody had gone and done gone through the work to do that. And that and and like that's amazing. Mm-hmm. That's and, amazing. And yeah. uh, you know, I guess what I'm getting at that is those 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 trees. They just they, they just live there. They just grew up there. We should, they were they were wild trees. We should have a program uh, which we can take people out that that haven't hunted that want to. Hunt. Is there a thing like that? Ah, uh, there is. Yeah, There's the state like of Wisconsin that. does that. I actually met a, a couple from Baraboo. They've now moved to Colorado. That um, was the alley oop. He is now slam dunking the basketball into the hoop. Right. <laughs> uh, met a couple up up north of us here, um, not hunters at all, not even a little bit, like not in the family. Um, both of them work for environmental nonprofits. Um, probably fit a stereotype for people that work for environmental nonprofits, and had gotten onto the sustainability train and like just were, were in, or, or I guess open-minded to the prospect of doing something different in nature other than their level or version of conservation. Both of them went turkey hunting with the Wisconsin program that brings uh, non-hunters out in the field. Learn to oh, hunt, yeah. right? Yep, learn to hunt. Yep. Uh, we're successful in harvest of a turkey went through the entire array and, and full range of emotions. Like, this is something we've never even come close to doing. And, in fact, probably we're on the opposite side of the fence of hunting, um, considering our line of work and, and, and uh, lifestyle. And then now took this turkey. And we'd never, like, really conversed as people. It was like mm-hmm. pleasantries exchanged, and that was it. And then we sat and chattered for three hours about how this went down. And I thought it was just fascinating. And um, well, you know, the other thing that's fascinating about that is the instant connection that you guys had, 100%. And, 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 and maybe Just like that, maybe yeah. that's anything. Maybe if you go through, you went to a car show, Jim, you would have this instant connection, like you have this commonality of, of something that you're passionate Mark, about. Mark, I've tried having this connection with you. When you change your tires, I tried talking to you about them, and you just you didn't carry it on. Really? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> I'm no. so sorry. Both of you just like deflated across the table. At least, it's all right. With like five days ago, I'd have remembered how big they were. I didn't expect. I didn't expect you to. It's all right. But the, yes, no, the story. The Jim, storytelling. Ten plies. <laughs> okay, I went back. The storytelling is something. It is. Yeah, it was. It was neat. I, I guess I'm. I was just really. I was just really happy to see that it worked in that in that situation. We got a guy here who's been in like every learn to hunt that there is. Micah, he oh. was on our podcast. Did you know that? No. I'm Dude. pretty sure like almost every single learn to hunt that is available in Wisconsin, almost every single one he has done. I think he may have done everyone because he just he did might the archery have, one. I think he just completed like uh, his loop, if you will, this yeah. year. And Micah, it's funny, man. Learn like, to hunt with dogs, learn to hunt um, deer, turkey, waterfowl. waterfowl. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. They had well, and what got him? What was his catalyst? What I can't remember what he said was his catalyst because I, I think he would kind of got on the organic food train. Yeah, I think that's what it was. He went vegetarian for a while, and then he got on the kind of organic meat and harvesting of um, meat, and he didn't have anybody in his family who was really that into it, mm-hmm. and he decided that he wanted to get into it, and and that that's one of the neat things when you see somebody. Throw all caution to the wind. Come from the other side of the spectrum, too. Yeah, or really any any side of the spectrum is is it's always nerve wracking to try something new. Oh, Dude, yeah. that's super it, intimidating. It always is. But and and I think the thing that people need to realize, and I think if I remember right, Micah was saying he said, you know, every single person that he went on on a learn to hunt with, who was then sort of and they're perceived and they and they truly are in many ways. This is a sort of very uh, uh, experienced hunter, expert level, maybe, if you will, they all had to start out brand new at mm-hmm. some point, too. Mm-hmm. And once you sort of are able to get 
the idea out of your head that you are going to be, for whatever reason, embarrassed if you don't do well the first time or you look stupid or you ask a dumb question. Once you get that out of your head, I've always, I've always really respected people that can say that they are okay with that just to get into something that they truly want to do. Mm-hmm. It's sad when people really want to do something, but they never end up doing it because they've always been afraid to do it. Yes. But yeah, anyway, that's what he did. And yeah, now he that, now the guy hunts. Dude, all the time. All the time. Wow. The guy... The food component, though, for him... Yeah, big like, time. I, like, I, I love the fact that he... You know, like, I get... He made little, like, squirrel crescent roll things. Amazing. Squirrels in a blanket the other day. <laughs> like, he's really like... Good. It's just funny to say. It is, it squirrels is. Squirrels in a blanket. Like, he's he's funny, and I guess maybe it's because he's done all those different learn to hunts, but, like, I, like, I think during, like, the height of, like, where, like, if I had one minute to hunt during the whitetail rut, like, I'm going to be bow hunting whitetails in this state or another state or something like that, right? Mike was like, ah, I'm going to go squirrel hunting. <laughs> Which in my mind, like, you know, starts to short. So I'm like, Mike, you can't waste this day on squirrel hunting. You're right? a crazy person. But like, because I live, like, for me, I'm probably most passionate about big game. Like, I kind of live, a, I've said it before, like a big game centric. That's what I focus on. I do, I do a little bit of everything, but like, if you said, Mark, pick, that's what I'm going to do. And during, certainly, like, if I was going to hunt squirrels, I'd be like, yeah, early October, I guess let's go chase some squirrels. You know, I can burn a day. Mm-hmm. You know, and I say, that's a horrible thing to say. I can burn a day chasing squirrels because it's not, like, that good. I don't know. Anyway, I love that about Micah, though. Like, he's like, yeah, the buck should be on fire today. Well, I'm go grab the old 22 and try and get a limit of squirrels. I like that. I like that, too. That's cool. I feel really good. This was a good talk. It was a good talk. We got we went a lot of places. Did we kind of talked about why we hunt? I think we got there. Yeah. I think I, I, for some know. people it's just in them. For some people they just they love it. It just it, I think that's what I was gonna like. I love it. It just isn't my thing that is encoded in me. So there's probably like there's probably like a couple levels of people who love hunting, right? Mm-hmm. People like you guys. It's just there. People who love it, but it's not necessarily like the thing. People who are kind of like, yeah, I'll do it once. I like the social component of deer camp. Yeah, like if I don't go, whatever. Yeah. And the people who don't. People who don't go. Don't go. Get a hobby. I think that's the biggest thing. Get something you're passionate about. Get something that makes you want to wake up for tomorrow. Try it outside first. Mm-hmm. If, you're, if you're thinking, if you're lost and you need direction... Just pick one, walk. You'll find some really cool stuff out there. Maybe you don't hunt. Maybe you become a, an agronomist or a, uh, an arborist or yeah, uh, you know, something like that. Hunting is a really cool one, though. I will say, like, if I had an alternative thing that was like my number one thing of all time to be hunting, just because when I see people that it is, they are just firing on all cylinders when they're doing it. It's super cool watching them track, watching them look at rubs and sign and watching them pick random stuff up off the ground and say, oh, yeah, this is this, and the deer like this, so they're going to be around here, or knowing what time of day means certain thing or knowing where to sit and find a deer that's going to come by. And I think it's an it's incredible thing to watch, and it's, it's a really neat thing to get into because you, you draw on... I think this is where people get into the whole like primal thing. Mm-hmm. You draw on senses and skills that only your brain, not a phone, not a tablet, a computer, um, an analog braking system, not any <laughs> of that stuff can determine for you. I didn't think you'd it's all in there. it's all sort of comes down to just you and your brain. Well, I think I think there's very few things, and I've probably said this and before, too. And then a too. modern rifle or compound bow. <laughs> yes. Um, I think there's very few things where where every, every like you said, you brought up senses, Jim, every sense in your body, and everything is, is truly activated. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, and you are truly, at least I know for myself, like, truly present in, like, every way you can be. Yeah. Like, I, I just think there's few things in life where where you're like that. I'll agree with you there. I yeah, 
Oh, that's, a, that's a good reason why I hunt. That's a good one, Mark. I'm going to use that one. I mean, cool. think, think about it. Every twig snap, everything. Everything has meaning. All right. All right. Uh, yeah, that was a little bit of a different podcast than I think we've usually done. So yeah, let us know what everybody thinks about that. And, uh, yeah, let us know why you hunt, too. Hit us up in the old comments on Instagram or wherever you're listening, if it has comment abilities. And, uh, yeah, I think we'll sign off with that one. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. We'll catch you next time. See ya. See ya. Bye. Bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.